welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to Twit Wow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. And this is our Lucha Underground review. And baby, does it feel good to say that again? Now, guys, we're doing things a bit differently. As you know, we already did live reactions to this episode tonight, but we thought we'd follow it up with a more structured, potentially more substantive TwitWow review. And quite honestly, this episode was so amazing, so epic, so in your face with its own awesomeness, it warranted both styles of TwitWow commentary. But don't take my word for it. Let's see what my cohort and commentary here thinks. Yeah, I really wanted us to make sure that we did both Lucha Underground live reactions and an episode of TwitWow because uh, from what we understand, this season is going to be packed not only with action, which is kind of what the live reactions are for, but also with story, which is why we do this episode of TwitWow afterwards because during live reactions, we're going a thousand miles a minute and we don't really let anything sink in until afterwards. So we do the twit while afterwards to really kind of get down to the nitty gritty and discuss the finer points of Lucha Underground, where we might be going, what certain things might have meant, and just kind of go full on analytical, which we're definitely not even considering doing during live reactions. Yeah. Yes, because during live reactions with a show like Lucha Underground, if you think we're doing anything other than just being fans to the max, you're kidding yourself. So and that's that being why we said, John, I wanted to pose to our viewers, if you guys would be down for it, I've been talking to John, and we would probably be willing to do both live reactions and TwitWow for every episode of Lucha Underground this season. Last season, we did a lot of TwitWows, and we live reacted to one one actual show and then of course ultima lucha but every time we did one or the other it always felt like we would have been better off doing both so now this season i'm pretty sure we're going to end up doing both for every episode we want viewer input though if you guys think that that's just kind of a content overload with you know those two lucha videos plus an nxt video coming at you on every wednesday if that's too much tell us and we'll back off or we'll try and figure out a way to maybe stagger it so that we're not doing all three of those videos in the same night. We'll figure something out. But if you're down for it, let us know that too. And we'll just keep doing it. But that being said, John, this was an amazing start to Lucha Underground season two. And I think that the best way to prove how good of a start it was is to get into our first segment. He of the night and i had to suppress the laughter because get the hell out of here i'm telling you right now as soon as we're done this review i'm getting on the phone with my real estate agent i'm buying a uh, property in goddamn antarctica there was no heat of the night for me not even freaking close this was an amazing season premiere and let me just say this before i hand the ball over to ashton here I believe, in my personal opinion, there was so much pressure on Lucha Underground tonight because everybody's paying attention to them now. ESPN, Forbes, people on Reddit, you know, casual. The more people are learning about this, so more eyes are on them, which means a greater obligation to deliver. Deliver. They knocked it out of the damn park. No heats the night tonight. Ashton, what about you? I was getting ready to be all smarmy and be like, oh, yeah, I have a heat of the night that this show was too short and I want more. But let's be real. Not even a fake out is worth giving a heat of the night to this show. I think even though we all know that you had the intention of faking this out, I think if you would say that in public, I have a, you wouldn't even finish the sentence because you get mugged. I feel like this was so good. Anybody that would think, wait, what? I just, um. My God, unbelievable. This Dude, and, was... and you, you bring up Lucha Underground increasing in popularity. I've seen posts from people on Reddit talking about how they upgraded their cable package so that they could watch Lucha Underground because they made sure that they could get El Rey. Wow. See, now that's real commitment right there when you put your money behind it. And I wish I had that it. option, but sadly, if you go to the Lucha Underground website, or the El Rey website it is, they have like a, a, a channel finder so that you can type in your zip code and it'll tell you what channel it is. And I don't have the ability to get it with my cable service. So I'm kind of boned on that. John, you don't have cable at all. So 
We obviously had to find other means to watch this episode, but it was well worth it. This show was amazing. Let's get into it. All right, let us get right into our Lucha Underground Review. And we open up, not in the temple, people. We open up in a psychiatric facility where Ian Hodgkinson is being evaluated. Ashton, what would you think of this, brother? This was incredible. Here's what I loved about this. So, obviously, we start off with the evaluation. You know, do you have any more violent thoughts or anything? You know, you having trouble sleeping? Anything like that. Just this, this full-on, like, questionnaire. Like, they're getting ready to release him. It said, days without an incident, 181. That's basically six months. And then he, he suggests, the, the guy that's evaluating Vampiro suggests that Vampiro avoid situations, places, and people that trigger his psychosis. And we see Vampiro flip out. He gets up out of his chair. He goes over, grabs the guy, slams his head in the table. People are coming in. He's elbowing people left and right. He slams people up against the wall. He goes back to the original guy that was evaluating him, slams him down one more time, and bites his neck. And then we snap back to reality and realize that whole scene was just in his mind. And he says, I think I can do that. And then he gets the antipsychotic drugs and he gets released. And Matt Stryker picks him up in a sweet ass low rider. You know what I loved about this Ashton, outside of like, you know, content and stuff like that. What I loved about this, this was the perfect segment to open up with for first time viewers, just to really set the tone. Yeah, we really are different from WWE like you've been hearing about. Like, this just proves to everybody, this is not your run-of-the-mill wrestling product. No, like, Everything... this feels like a scene you would see in freaking Breaking Bad. Yeah, exactly. You know, just, just a high-drama, high-intensity kind of quality program like that. And yeah, I just love that this kind of validates, again, for first-time viewers that may have been hearing rumblings or whatever, Lucha Underground's identity. This is telling the first-time viewer, forget what you heard, because we are so much more than that. Yeah. And yeah, that... I love the tone they set up here with this segment. And just to know again that he didn't break and it was just in his head, that was a great fake out. Because honestly, I could have gone either way. And just the idea, you know, that he is kind of still keeping it together, to me is even more terrifying. Because when is the explosion going to come? If it comes at all. And if it does, my God, how many casualties is he going to take with him? This was amazing. Yeah, this was... I love the way that they shot this. I love the fake out where it's like, oh my God, he's flipping out. He's not going to come back. And and then it's like, no, no, no. That was just an illusion. That was just him thinking that he wishes he could do that. But he's got himself under control. He's got these thoughts, but he's got them under control, or so we hope. And then obviously the scene with Stryker was cool. And I love this too. I didn't even notice the first time around. But when Vampiro asked Stryker if anything had changed at the temple, Stryker said that it was a much darker place. The last words that Pentagon or that Vampiro said in season one, Pentagon asked him, where are we going now, master? And he said to a much darker place. Oh my God. The content. Cont I can't even speak. It's so good. You can't even English right now because it's so amazing. And I, I love it too. I, I love that Stryker, you know, Vampiro, they're not just but in their own way, they are kind of characters because they have this dialogue, they have this moment. Yeah. And, well, you know, there is a position open for us, but again, to your point, Ashton, it has become a much darker place. And then Piro's just like, hey, I'm down. I've got meds now. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. So, I, I love it, man. I love it so much. I mean... I could, I could talk about this one segment alone endlessly, but I know we've got so much to talk about, so I'm just going to shut up here. But, man, what a tone they set right out of the box, man. Yeah, this first scene was an amazing tone setter. And then we immediately get into the temple. Specifically, we see Katrina in Cueto's, formerly Cueto's office. Now it's her freaking office, staring out the window. Phoenix walks in. And she says that she's surprised to see him here. He's here for Mill. He wants the championship. And Katrina tells Phoenix, being the proprietor, I have to make you wait a week to do that. And in the meantime, there's a man that's been hunting you for months now who is 
really aching to get his hands on you, and your match is next. So we get Phoenix versus King Cuerno, first match of the season. Yeah, gift of the gods, Cuerno and Phoenix, and you want to talk good. God, I'm sorry, John, you cut out there. Other. You want to talk about They what? went back. You want to... I said, these two guys killed each other. Back and forth and back and forth. Came at each other with everything. And I'm going to be honest, guys. And, and this is just me being real with all of you. Phoenix is probably one of the most incredible athletes I've ever seen with the stuff that he does. And, like, I with know... the balancing on, on NXT, acts that he pulls off? The, dude, the balancing acts, just the athletic in general, the things that he could pull off that, you know, I'm sure you could probably, you know, see elsewhere or whatever, but he's got a finesse to him that I don't see with anybody else. And I think that's the difference. Like, with, with Phoenix, it's not just the fact that he does these moves. He does them so gracefully, he ups the aesthetic, and I love it. It's just really one of the most quality performers I think I have seen. And given the people that I rave about and knowing that I don't even rave about Phoenix, that way that is a huge compliment you know i'm giving to him him coming his way uh and cuerno my god what a beast that man is i miss ring work immensely and i can only imagine how much you missed watching cuerno perform in ring dude yeah cuerno is phenomenal and like you said, Phoenix is an amazing athlete. I think that I, I wouldn't say that he's the most outstanding athlete I've ever seen just because it's like even in Lucha Underground, you've got Aerostar, you've got Puma, you've got Angelico, you've got Son of Havoc. Like there are some incredible athletes in there, but Phoenix is definitely among the top tier. I'll say that. Yeah, without question, dude, this match was fantastic. What were some of your favorite moments in this match? Um, to me, the biggest moment for me in the match was the kick out. The fact that Cuerno hit the thrill of the hunt on Phoenix and Phoenix kicked out of it. That blew my mind. If you really want to know what we reacted to the most, go check out our live reactions. We have live reactions up. This was in there. We reacted to everything. So, you know, this match, obviously part of that, but as far as just what I remember, the two big spots that Cuerno hit the big, you know, he hits the thrill of the hunt and Phoenix kicks out and then the package tombstone pile driver to win the gift of the gods championship from Phoenix. Phoenix held that title for like five months, but he wasn't on a single episode of Lucha Underground with it where he didn't lose it. Right. His first televised appearance with the championship, he said and again people this is where i say and i'm glad they did this too again because if you're a first-time viewer because i i speak from experience okay if you're a first-time viewer you probably sauntered in watching this thinking okay well i know how wrestling works i've been watching wwe or this one or that one for x amount of time clearly they're going to keep the belt on phoenix because he has some kind of beef with muertes uh-uh uh, uh, you're not able to do that in Lucha Underground. Lucha Underground takes every book ever written on how to book a pro wrestling show, and it incinerates it, and it laughs in your face while it's doing it. And I love that, because I think any other promotion, Phoenix would have retained here, and he would have gotten his match with Muertes. But here, Cuerno takes it from him, so that opens up a whole new realm of narrative possibilities. Just, I mean, dude, Lucha Underground staying true to itself, and I freaking love it. Yeah, what I love most about, well, I'm, I'm not even going to try and preface it with that because there's so much <laughs> that I love about Lucha Underground, it's not even funny, but something else that I love about Lucha Underground is the fact that they aren't ashamed of moving their titles around a lot. Like, if it suits the story, Hot Potato can never be a bad thing as long as it suits the story. And I think that's the only caveat where you could get away with it too because you know like wwe doesn't have that leg to stand on when they hot potato yeah uh but lucha underground to me and we've even talked about this you know it's it's not necessarily a wrestling product it, it's a television show about a wrestling product so all this idea about prestigious titles and this that and the other and i can't believe i'm saying this but i say it in a good way 
it's secondary to me when I look at Lucha Underground because the big thing about Lucha Underground is the narrative, is the story that they're telling about this temple and the people in it. So because of that, I think they're able to get away with things like this. And yeah, I'm not even miffed that Phoenix lost the thing because first of all, he lost it to a, a caliber performer in Cuerno. So it's not like he lost to a scrub. And second of all, again, knowing that it's about the story, this opens up so many possibilities now. They don't constrict themselves. I love that Lucha Underground, and I said this a lot in season one, and I'm going to say it again here. They have so much confidence in their own product and in the people that are a part of it that they, they open themselves up to those possibilities. And it was definitely illustrated in this opener. I fucking loved it. Absolutely. So then after the opener, we see Ivelisse on Helico and Son of Havoc arriving at the temple. It's the same sort of scene that we got in the trailer for season two that you and I reacted to. And they show up, they do the little pose, they walk in, and Katrina cuts them off at the pass and says, oh, well, they obviously they say that they want the trio's titles back. They're here, they're ready to fight. And Katrina says, that's good, but you're not going after the trio's titles. Tonight, you're facing each other. And they're all up in arms. But then Katrina adds the caveat, oh, and by the way, the winner gets a shot at Mill and the world title. So now, not only do these three get to fight each other, but they have incentive to not hold back. And, and I love that all of this comes ju just as they have really connected as a unit, just yeah. as they have really gotten on the same page. It's like, oh, man, you know, we're finally getting along. Isn't this great? Oh, yeah, you know, guys. As I'm seeing you're really all getting along there. It would be a shame if something happened to that. Oh, yeah, you're going to fight each other, and the winner gets a world title shot. And then, like, just dogs fighting over a piece of sting, baby. It, it's just, oh, my God. Amazing. I love yeah. it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so then, obviously, we get the match itself. But before the match starts, in the backstage area in the locker room, we see King Cuerno at his locker you know, getting ready to leave the the temple, it looks like. He's kind of tucking the uh, the Gift of the Gods championship away. He has it kind of rolled up. It looks really cool. Uh, it looks almost like some kind of like a totem when it's rolled up like that. But um, Katrina shows up and says, just remember our deal. And Cuerno's just like, you have nothing to worry about. And then Katrina literally vanished. This woman teleports. I don't think she's actually a, a human being. I want to know what she is. I mean, I still say she's a succubus of some kind, but I don't ever remember a succubus in any kind of lore that has teleportation ability. Yeah. So maybe that takes it off the table. But maybe regardless, she is a Lucha Underground mythological creation. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, hell, dude, anything is possible in this place. Nothing is absurd in the Lucha Underground universe. That's my mantra going forward. And I'm just curious what this deal is. Because you know... I can't fathom that King Cuerno would just willingly give up a world title opportunity. I think he's just doing what a hunter does. He's lying in wait, but the question is for what? What are you waiting for? And that's what I'm eager to find out. It's a really good question. That is a really good question. But next we see uh, it says 300 plus miles away from the temple we see a group of three guys in a car, and they were lost looking for an underground fight club. Black Lotus shows up at the window and tells them that she'll lead them there. So we'll get a follow-up on that at the very end of the episode. But up next, we get the triple threat. Ivelisse, Angelico, Son of Havoc. These three are amazing, and they kill each other. Just, everybody fought their hearts out in this thing. And, and can I just say, too, and I know you and I were saying it a lot during live reactions. Again, do not forget to check those out, guys, because we lost our minds quite a bit, I would like to think. Uh, seeing Ivelisse back in the ring, doing what she loves to do, felt so good. Uh, Son of Havoc, flying all over the place at one point, does a suicide dive. Uh, Helico, then to Ivelisse, but then Ivelisse comes back with Hurricane Ranas and forearms and chops and just showing everybody she's the baddest bitch in the building. At one point, Angelico got a killer knee, I believe, to Ivelisse, taking her head well, off. Well, yeah, I mean, he was aiming for Son of Havoc, but Son of Havoc got out of the way, and Ivelisse was behind him, so he nailed her. I mean, just unbelievable. And then I loved how the finish was done, but then... What? I don't want to get out of myself. Are there any spots you wanted to highlight before I talk about how much I love the finish? The big knee in the corner was the big one that caught me off guard. Right. Because, yeah, that looked devastating. 
But then I love the finish because you have Son of Havoc. He's like, he's popping himself up. It seems like he's going to get that shooting star press. But Ivelisse straddles Son of Havoc on the rope, and yeah. she gets a Mahistral Cradle pin on Angelico, and that gets the three count. So yep. Ivelisse has pinned Angelico. And you know something? I didn't think about this when we were live reacting because, as you said, we're not analytical in live reactions. We don't look at things thoughtfully in live reactions. I think... First of all, she deserved this regardless because she's a caliber performer. But I think this was her reward, her pat on the back for toughing it out through that injury like a boss, showing up, being a part of the product, and not sitting on the sidelines. They know what a quality worker they have in her. And this was them saying, you know what, Ivelisse, let's take you to the next level, if even just for one night. And I love that. I love that the idea that because she showed up, she put in the work, she wouldn't allow herself to be relegated or forgotten about despite an injury – that they, you know, they give her the shine here, and she gets the win. And I, and I love it, too, because it's, again, breaking down those barriers. Because if you're a first-time viewer, maybe you have this perception of women's place in wrestling by WWE standards or whatever. And you've got Eva Lisa here competing for the world title. It's not engendered, just world title. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yep. Absolutely. And then uh, I believe that after this, we had the setup for the main event. As you said, Ivelisse picks up the victory with um, Mahistro Cradle. Uh, and then before the match starts, we see obviously Katrina and Mill come out and then the disciples come out. So the disciples are still around. They come out. And what I loved about this, I don't remember which one's which, so I'm not even going to try and dif differentiate. I'll just go by mass color. Um, the, the other two guys were removing on Helico and son of havoc from the ring. And the purple f masked guy was in the ring and Eva Lee's turned around to fight him. And she started swinging at him. And all he did was duck, get out of the way and roll out of the ring. He did literally nothing because he had no, there was never any intention to harm Eva Lee's. The intention the entire time was just to even the playing field so that it was a clean one-on-one -on -one match. Sadly, it also had Katrina at ringside for Eva Lee's case. But the idea is they wanted to remove on Helico and son of havoc from the situation. So Katrina and mill had the disciples do that bidding for them. They take those guys out. And this whole time, Mill is kind of holding Ivelisse by the throat. And then when the guys are out, she, he just kind of throws her across the ring. Uh, so we get the match then. The match itself happens. We get Ivelisse just trying her heart out to do anything to Mill. You know, it's funny. Are you? Do you know who Mike Graham was? No. Okay. Mike Graham was uh, a wrestler and a promoter and... He worked in WCW uh, in the, the mid to late 90s, from what I understand. And I, I saw an interview with him, um, and he uh, at one point he brought up the cruiserweights. And he, he talked about how, you know, when Eddie Guerrero and Benoit and Saturn and uh, Malenko jumped ship, he saw it as a good thing because they were paying them a couple million dollars. And according to him, now... I'm not trying to say this is true fact, but according to him, those guys never drew a dime. But the one thing that he said that always sticks with me is that the cruiserweights were always an amazing tightrope act, but they could never be the lion tamer. Mil Muertes is the freaking lion tamer. Yes. This guy is an absolute beast. I love the way this match was structured because it was just Ivelisse trying to fight from the ground up the entire time. Exactly. I mean, she was she was getting these body blows. Mill wasn't selling them. Kicked her in the heart at one point, which looked devastating. Yeah. And then she, yeah, then she would try submissions. She got a guillotine at one point. Mill quickly reverses that into a bear hug and then just kind of ravaged her that way. I mean, and here's the thing. The great thing about Mill Muertes, and I even, uh, this is a line I had, I believe, in live, live reactions, doesn't even matter again that Evil Lee's is like a woman or whatever, because I guarantee if it was Son of Havoc or on Helico getting those body blows, it would have had the same effect. Mill is just otherworldly. It doesn't matter what you are or what you bring. It is going to take so much to get this guy down. And Eva Lise was making progress. There was a point here she got a uh, tornado DDT off the top. And I believe that actually got a two count on Mil Muertes. Yeah, so that was, 
that that was my biggest mark out moment of the match. Like she, well, my second biggest, I would say she got that. She had it like the headlock. I saw it as just like another guillotine, but she had it locked in and then she jumped off and she did it like the tornado DDT. She went for the pin and it was so close. Mill pulled one of those things like what he did against Puma at the end of the last season where he rather than actually kicking out, he just kind of punched the air. Right. And it was such a close near fall. And then we get Katrina coming in the ring. And I'm just thinking, what is she doing? Why is she in the ring? Like, can't she trust Mill to handle his business by himself? And Ivelisse is is right near her. And then Mill goes to spear Ivelisse, but she moves out of the way. And Mill ends up spearing Katrina. Yes. And Mill is just looking dismayed, you know, in, in that moment in time, because it's like, oh my God, I just speared Katrina. What did I do? Evil Lee tries capitalizing with a roll up. And I mean, I'll be honest, you know, again, you just, you always turn your brain off this and that. It suckered me. And I'm thinking, are they actually going to give Evil Lee the world title over Mill freaking Muertes? But he does kick out. Uh, she tries a bit more, you know, valiantly, to, you know, to keep the fight on Mill. But it's all for naught, as ultimately he does hit the flatliner on her for the three count. But way to make Eva Lee look, you know, confident and game in the face of Mil Muertes. This was not a lamb going to slaughter. This was somebody fighting with everything they had. She would not go quietly. And I thought that was a fun matchup. Yeah, it was. I, there are actually people saying that it was the match of the night. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that was probably Cuerno uh, Phoenix, but I, all three matches were solid. Um, this was great just because of the hope spots. You know, you had, you know, the, the tornado DDT and then the spear to Katrina, Ivelisse going into it. It felt like she never really stood a chance. And there was just enough in this match to make you think, Oh my God, are they actually going to do this? And the way that they set it up too was brilliant because we already had a title change at the beginning of the night. So you're thinking, well, if, if they changed the title at the beginning of the night, who's to say they won't do this just to make a statement, right? And that's, I think, another strength, Ashton, that comes with um, Lucha Underground throwing out any preconceived notions of how to book a wrestling show is because because it creates such ambiguity, you really can't say anything with any kind of certainty. And I think that's one of the greatest strengths this show has because then when they do just go with Mil Muertes retaining the title, you can't even really say that you were disappointed or, oh, Lucha Underground doesn't do any certain... This whole goddamn show is one giant swerve. Get over yourself. And you can't be angry again because you, you weren't you know certain about anything. Thing. I love it. I love it, dude. Yeah, this was awesome. You know, the match itself wasn't anything special unless you just count the hope spots that were amazing. Uh, but the, the story that was told is what really matters. And that was what was awesome. Yeah. And you want to talk about story. I want you to go first. What did you think about all that unfolded in the post match, dude? Well, let's just kind of go over it in the post match. We had, uh, Mill getting ready to deliver a second flatliner to Ivelisse. He did win the match with a flatliner. Uh, getting ready to deliver a second one. And next thing you know, who should arrive but Prince freaking Puma. The lord and savior of Lucha. The king of season one. He is still here. He has not abandoned the temple like I was sort of maybe questioning. Maybe he left. But no, he is still here. He comes out. He super kicks the absolute shit out of Mill, grabs Ivelisse, and literally carries her through the ropes and out of the ring. And next thing you know, when Mill is staring down Puma, who should show up behind Mill in the ring but Pentagon freaking Jr.? My mark out of the fucking night right here. Oh, and it's not even close. Like... Sure, Mill spearing Katrina was great, and Ivelisse getting a two count on Mill was great, and even the big knee to Ivelisse from Angelico was amazing, and, you know, Cuerno winning the title was incredible, but when Pentagon Jr. shows up in the middle of the ring with Mill Muerte staring in the opposite direction, and he's literally putting his finger up to his mouth as if to say, shh, be quiet, fans, don't let him know I'm here, and then delivering a massive lung blower, Two mil. 
I, and then he broke his arm. He did the, the Pentagon submission. He grabs him while he's down, wraps his leg or, or his arm around his leg and pulls back as hard as he can. I don't know if they're going to really sell this as like a full blown mill might be out for a month kind of injury. But no the, al- al- the alternative is, I mean, mill is freaking superhuman. So what would break normal people's arms just kind of tickles him a little bit. Uh, but he was selling the arm. He was at least in pain. So at the very least, we know the Pentagon can hurt him, right? Right? Pentagon, don't give no shits, man. Dude. He just went right for the top dog immediately. Uh, dude, it's so... <laughs> I love, too, that immediately, right off the bat, we've got five... No, not five. Seven different people gunning for Mil Muertes. King Cuerno has the Gift of the Gods title. Phoenix wants the Gift of the Gods title because he wants to go after Mil. All three members of Team Havoc had an opportunity to go against Mill tonight, and they went hard for it. So obviously they all want it. Puma is clearly out to get his revenge, and Pentagon is going after Mill as well. So in one episode, we went from two contenders, that being Puma for his rematch and a Gift of the Gods match, to seven. And what I love about it, Ashton, is all seven contenders in one vein or another are completely legitimate. Absolutely. No. No, nothing yeah. questionable about any of them. I mean, even it, honestly, just based exclusively on stature, being big and strong, Ivelisse is the shortest person, and physical strength-wise, she and maybe Angelico are probably tied for the weakest, but Ivelisse proved that she could hang tonight, and it took... Herb having been in a match prior and a Katrina distraction for Mill to finally put her away. Exactly. I mean, way to protect Evil East. Like, out of the gate, you know that she's probably going to have one of the strongest seasons, you know, in season two. And I just, I can't believe we already have this crowd of classic contenders. And the idea, and here's the thing too, folks, if you're wondering, because we've been talking about Pentagon, he did have eye contact with Vampiro. The camera did pan to Vampiro looking at the actions of Pentagon at one point. Uh, I think his face, he didn't try and register anything, but I'm dying to know what he's thinking about all this. Is he proud of Pentagon? Is he thinking Pentagon's rushing into this a bit too hastily and they need a plan? Like, what is he thinking about all this? I loved it. I love that Pentagon isn't going to wait in line. They're not going to do, again, that traditional route of, oh, let's let's build Pentagon up. You know, let's give him, like, a template to work with. No, here's your goddamn template. I'm going to break his arm off, and then we're going to go from there. Like, oh, my God, I'm so jazzed up after that, dude. That was incredible. Yeah, that was, and that was the best moment of the night, and it's it wasn't even over. That's the crazy thing. The night wasn't even over because after all of this amazing just insanity goes down in the temple, we go to this point 300-plus miles away from the temple again, and we see these three lost guys with Black Lotus walking up to what says the temple. So I'm guessing that now Cueto has started a new temple a new fight club and we see for the first time all season so far dario cueto finally he's still around he has the key around his neck and these guys are like hey we heard there would be some kind of an underground fight club cueto you know tells them what's going on they're just like hey what's what's the deal with the chick and then she beats the shit out of one of them and then Quaita is just like, hey, if you want to fight, it's 20 bucks. And each one of these guys walks by and hands him a 20 spot. And they go into this door. And then just as uh, the guys are walking into the darkness, one of them turns around and asks Quaito, hey, who's fighting tonight? And Quaito says, you are. And then he closes the door and locks it. And all you hear is viscera. <laughs> yep. Just these visceral screams, baby. Because they're dead. <laughs> they are just dead as a doornail after that. We've already that. tripled our body count from season one, and we're only one episode in. Oh, my God. People, the biggest compliment I can give this season premiere, it didn't even have Johnny Mundo on it for me. And honestly, it didn't need it. I would even go as far as to say that if he was on this show, it probably would have hindered it because I think that would have been oversaturation. I think this had just enough in one hour to have me begging, begging 
for more. We waited all these months, and I know now all we have to do is wait a week, but even that feels like too long. That's how amazing this premiere was. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter season, but they have packed so much more into each episode that it is not going to feel shorter unless you count the fact that an hour-long episode feels like 20 minutes only pass. Exactly. So, so with that said, do you want to get into our next segment? Yes, sir. All right, high spots and low shots. My low shot is easy. Those three jabronis who died tonight, because you're not going to have a worse night in your life than freaking dying. Nothing's going to top that. So, yeah, those three scrubs, they're my low shot. So, well, yeah, I mean, I can't argue with that, but I will say my low shot didn't really die, but he's also kind of incapable of dying. Mil Muertes has tried multiple times, but he did lose the, the championship that he thought would give him a chance to go against Mill again, and that's Phoenix. He, you know, he shows up at the temple hoping for a title shot. He gets told immediately you have to wait a week, but by the way, you're defending that title tonight, and now King Cuerno has it. And there's a very good possibility that Cuerno is basically just going to hold that belt hostage and never plans on cashing in on Mill because yeah, of the agreement the between him and Katrina. Yeah, there you go. So I think that's an excellent low shot. I'm going to continue right along. My high spot, Dario Cueto. Because even when he's hundreds of miles away from the temple, he's always in the back of your mind. And he's just as confident, just as sinister, and just as violent as ever. So if you think Dario Cueto's out of the picture, if you think he's just going to go quietly while Katrina and Milmuertes do as they please... I think you've got another thing coming. So Dario Cueto, because of what uh, the future holds, uh, he's my high spot. Yeah, I like that. Um, it's so funny because we both have high spots that are not even people that participated in matches tonight. And normally when we go high spot, we usually pick somebody that won a match. But, you know, here's my thing. Cuerno, I could say he's my high spot, but it seems like he and Katrina have a deal where he's not even going to try and use that title. So he's just going to have to kind of sit around and defend it against whoever uh, without it really seeing any benefits. Ivelisse won a match, but then she also lost a match. And Mil Muertes also won a match, but then he also got his freaking arm broken. So my high spot is the man that did the arm breaking, Pentagon Jr. I knew one of us was going to, and, I, and I'm glad you did. Because, yeah, Pentagon Jr., when you talk about guys like actually at the temple making a statement, nobody made... A, a, a louder proclamation, a more defiant proclamation than Pentagon Jr. Zero fear is, is right because while the name of the proprietor of the temple may have changed and while who runs it may have changed, Pentagon's attitude has not. And the idea that he gunned for Mil Muertes immediately and, well, I guess by normal human standards broke the arm maybe for uh, uh, Mil Muertes. Maybe he just hurt it a little bit. I don't know. But the idea that he even tried in the first place shows you where Pentagon's mind is. He made the biggest impact by far tonight as far as who was at the temple. I freaking love it. I miss Pentagon so much. And if this is the tone they're setting for his season, good God, he's going to blow everybody out of the water. Yeah, he really is. I, to me, the, the one, like, if you would have asked me at the end of season one, who did Lucha Underground do the best job of making into a star? I would have said Prince Puma. But as of right now, the answer to that question is Pentagon Jr. Because when he showed up in the ring, Puma did the same thing. He kind of just showed up in the ring and no one was expecting it, and he got a nice reaction, but Pentagon shows up in the ring, and that temple explodes. He is the Stone Cold Steve Austin of Lucha Underground. Yeah, that's the perfect description, too. And you know what? I think this one's actually deserved, because I've heard stuff like that in the past. Oh, this guy's this one, or that guy's that one. And it always feels like a bit of hyperbole to me. This feels earned, because the idea that the crowd loves the fact that Pentagon is just this violent human being that likes ending livelihoods and reveling in the suffering of others. And he's over with it. Like, what I just described sounds like the most sinister heel in all of wrestling, but they freaking love it. They lap it up like cats to milk, and it's amazing. And I love that Lucha Underground isn't trying to change it, isn't trying to manipulate the reactions like some promotions we know. <laughs> WWE, uh, WWE. Sorry, I got a little chest cold there. Uh, you yeah, know, and they're just running with normal. it. You really need to see a doctor. 
I, I do. I, I, I really do, man. But you know what? I just couldn't tonight because Lucha Underground was means, so though, freaking good. I mean, if you are going to see a doctor, try to avoid Amon and Maroon. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, I just love that they're running with it and that uh, Pentagon's just going to the freaking top, man, because he deserves it. I'm He's so amazing. excited. He is yeah. incredible. And, dude, like... I think that what's so awesome about the way that he's been built is in season one, obviously we got like that sneak peek of what he can do against legit opponents at the beginning of the season when he faced like Phoenix a couple times and he had that triple threat. It also involved Drago, but then he immediately started squashing jobbers. Like he went after the undercard and he killed everybody. And then the only other match that we really saw him in was the Vampiro match. So now it's like he has finally decided to to take a dip in the deep end and stop swimming in the kiddie pool. And people are freaking out about it because of how awesome he is. Dude, I mean, with the way Lucha Underground is pacing itself, we may get Mil Muertes versus Pentagon Jr. next week. I mean, I wouldn't say that that's impossible. So, Ooh, yeah, that's the thing, too, is like I, I wanted to say, like, no, they'll probably do Puma first and whatever. But you never know. Like they might Katrina might literally start the show by saying Pentagon Jr., you pissed me off. Get out here and eat your just desserts. And we get the match right then and there. Yeah, and Pentagon won't give a damn. He's like, well, that's what I wanted. Thanks. And I could see him. You know, honestly, I could count on one hand the people that I could believably buy beating Mil Muertes. Honestly, I can't even put my boy Johnny Mundo on that list if I'm being honest with everybody. My three people, Phoenix, Puma, and yeah, Pentagon. I think. What Pentagon about Son of can, Havoc? I don't know. I don't know. I think he can because he feeds on the energy of the believers and they could kind of make a cool story out of that, I think. Because you can tell, like, the what more about the Tunza? People... T- well, he's not an active competitor yet, but if he was, like, yeah, yeah. If he stakes his claim, I'd put him on that list. So that brings it up to five, but I'm not going more than Cage? five. No, no, I don't think so. I think Momoartes could beat Cage. I don't think Cage, I think he's got a lot of power, but he doesn't have the finesse to really go with it. He doesn't have the intellect to go with it. That's why, like, guys like Puma and stuff, I think he's going to be more cerebral this time around because he knows he got shame, beat at Ultima if Lucha. So I, think, around, yeah. I would say Hernandez would be an amazing matchup for Mill. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm telling you, just getting back on point and the point I wanted to make, I do believe Pentagon can beat Mill Muertes. Yeah. And, like, that, yes! you know, Dude, yeah. oh, my God. I'm yeah, so excited. <laughs> next week already can't get here. I'm actually pissed that it's not here already, to be honest. Know, I'm, I'm right? pissed that we're not going to be able to go off recording, go into season two, episode two, and then record to it. Wow, for that. Yeah. So that's my heat of the goddamn night. I'll co-sign onto yours. Like, not enough content. <laughs> And time's not going fast enough for my liking. Fuck yeah. you, time. Yeah, <laughs> like, why can't this be, like, Daredevil or Jessica Jones, where we can just watch every episode at our own pace and leisure, which, I mean, is to say consecutively. Exactly. Like, you know, we've got all these physicists and everything. You're giving me theories of time. Just build me the goddamn time machine. Like, just, just do it. <laughs> like, what are you wasting those university grants for? I don't give a shit. Just give me the time machine. And and, and especially because I'm really hoping we see Mundo next week. Because that's yeah. another thing this show did in a good way. Because we didn't get him tonight, and I know he's been a big part of promoting the second season and everything, they have got me jonesing for my fix so damn bad. And well, you know And then it, that's the you? thing, too, dude. We might have a little bit of a limited cast for right now because of the state of the temple. Mundo might have hightailed it and gotten out of the temple when he saw that proprietor (laughs) Katrina label on the door. Uh, And that's the intelligent thing. Once again, Mundo showing he's smarter than everybody else. Cause he's like, that's what "Um." I'm saying though, is like, we don't know enough about the state of the temple to make any assumptions about who's going to show up next week. We might have the same like nine people that we had this week, next week in the temple. We might get, uh, a trio's championship match and like maybe Cuerno will defend the gift of the gods against Phoenix in the rematch or maybe against Pentagon. I don't know. And maybe we'll get another sacrifice to mill from Katrina to keep him happy. Like you don't know, maybe mill won't even wrestle next week because of his arm. We don't know. And, you know, actually, I'm actually glad you brought up that possibility, because even though I don't think that'll be the case, I mean, if anybody had the balls to do it, it would be Lucha Underground. Yeah. And here's the thing, like, I, I think they could pull it off, too. That's the confidence and the just trust. Like, yeah, it's just like they can, like, take their, their time and, like, hey, all these people left the temple, so it's going to take a little bit for them to show up again. Exactly. And, and, dude, I mean, I've been so fixated on Mundo for obvious reasons, but, I mean, think about other people we didn't see tonight sexy star who's still in captivity we don't know like marty the, the moth yeah that. marty the moth 
his sister. You know, we didn't we didn't see oh, anybody. Oh, 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 oh. Dude, Ray, Ray, dude, Ray and PJ Black both. Yeah, I was just getting ready to say Ray Mysterio of all people. You didn't even use him on the season, and you didn't need to again. I, I can't stress that enough. But you didn't use possibly one of your biggest guns. You know, your ace of the hole that everybody was Look, so excited I about. Mean, no Ray I'm tonight. Not, I'm not the biggest Ray Mysterio fan, but let's be real. He is the biggest name that they have on their roster. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm not the biggest Ray Mysterio fan, but I understand and his value like as a brand unto himself like yeah. that's crazy they didn't play that card yet but again that's why i love lucha underground because they have so much confidence in their own guys and i love that because i honestly i think and i wouldn't have made it a heat of the night or anything but i think even if they did use ray in their first episode to me that would have said well you know we like our guys but we're not so confident let's just put ray out there just to really get that nice little bump that nice yep. little pop Yep. And they didn't do it because these guys believe in the roster that they've created. And for that reason, I, I, just, I know we already did the segment already, but just the people behind Lucha Underground, the minds and hearts behind it, you're my goddamn high spot. Because way <laughs> to believe in what you created. Way to believe in what you created and standing by it. I fucking bow to you for that shit. And yeah, dude, it's so funny you bring that up because I made the ill-advised decision to check out Impact Wrestling on Tuesday and see if you can guess who was in the main event. Wasn't it EC3 and Matt Hardy in the championship finals, or am I well, a few tapings ahead? No, that was I think that was last week, but even if that would have been the case, it would still be two former WWE guys. But no, it was even worse than that. It was Matt Hardy versus Jeff Hardy in the main event with Brodus Clay at ringside. Right. And like... Are, are you first of all? Are you okay after watching Impact? Are you all right? I didn't, I didn't pay that much attention to it. I just kind of it was one of those things where you and I were watching videos on the computer, and I just kind of had it on my TV so I could kind of glance over and see what was happening every now and then. And your eyes didn't bleed out even from glances. That's that's impressive. I know, uh, I know. And well, as soon as that main event came on, I I knew what was happening, and to prevent the the eye bleeding from happening, I turned the television off because I knew what was happening. Oh, thank goodness. That That's such a relief. Uh, but yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, dude, because again, like, I wouldn't have held it against Lucha Underground if they had Ray on, but I'm so proud of them that they withheld it, because first of all, it's going to mean even more now when he appears. Yeah. And second of all, it's like, no, we didn't build Ray. We're grateful Ray's with us, but we didn't build Ray. These are the people we built, and we trust them, and we're proud of them. Again, Ivelisse getting a world title shot. That's right, because you got it through your injury. You got through it like a goddamn boss. And now you're going to face the heavyweight champion of the world. These are people that respect and love their performers. Not since ECW have I felt like a locker room feels like a legitimate family of people. Yeah. Just and they, wanting to dude, the, each the other performers up. all even say that, too. Anytime you see an interview where someone asks, like, you know, what's the locker room atmosphere like? Almost everyone that I've seen interviewed has said that it feels like a family. Like, I've seen Mundo say that, Melissa Santos. Even Pentagon Jr. was in an interview, and he said that. Like, Rolling Stone interviewed Pentagon Jr., and he said that it felt like a family backstage. I love it. And, and I'm, I'm so proud and so privileged to watch this family every week. Yeah, because they it's are amazing. absolutely incredible. And that's yeah. that's how I'm going to end it. That's exactly. I, yeah, that's the perfect way to end it. And like the fact that it's our first episode back and we're already taking tangents just to praise the ever loving shit out of this show tells you what we really think of it. So, John, if you want to take us home, we have a, an inferior product to watch. I know, brother. I know. So let me pilot this thing home. Guys, this has been Lucha Underground, the season Premiere. This has been Twit Wow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. Guys, be sure to comment and subscribe on YouTube. Do not forget to check out our season two premiere live reactions. You get to hear us lose our shit. And Ashton, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. This may be tough for this one. What is your question for our subscribers this week for Lucha Underground? This isn't tough at all, actually. I had this prepared. What individual that we did not see on tonight's episode do you most want to see on next week's episode? Obviously, John's answer to that would be Johnny Mundo. My answer is PJ Black. I want to know what you guys think. 
Yeah, I'm very into I love that question, actually. So get the conversation started down in the comments. Be sure to take the conversation over to Pletoff. That is pro wrestling is taking over Facebook. A lot of loyal followers from the temple in that group. People losing their minds over the season two premiere. But if you want a different forum altogether, Ashton's created a TwitWow subreddit. There you will find all of our TwitWow content and you're able to create thread yourself related to all things pro wrestling, including Lucha Underground. And we will see you again for our NXT review where Blake and Murphy are going to take on American Alpha, who I can assure you are ready, willing, and tune in and peace out. That was Gable, by the way, because John cut out. I'm sorry.